Ripple Labs, which obviously has been embroiled in a years-long fight with the SEC now, is really making waves of late. A lot of news coming out of that firm, including today, news that they're starting a platform for central banks to issue their own CBDCs. This is sort of a private version of the XRP ledger, uh, en enabling you know uh, central bank authorities to issue both wholesale and retail CBDCs down the line. Now, this news comes right on the heels of a $250 million acquisition of crypto custody firm Medicare. Co. And also, we've seen some de developments in that SEC case relating to the so-called Hinman speech documents that we can maybe touch on in this conversation. But I'll throw it straight to Adam for the take on CBDCs. Um, certainly other uh, you know, blockchain uh, foundations have dabbled in, in making these platforms available to central bankers. Now Ripple is looking to get, on the, get in on the act. What's your take? Yeah, Ripple is really the original gangster when it comes to this type of blockchains that serve as banks use case thing. And given all of the kind of interest in central bank digital currencies, which largely has been stirred up by the existence of cryptocurrency and stable coins, and again, sort of forcing the, the existing systems need to compete, it's not surprising at all to me that we would see Ripple, we would see Ripple go this way. This is actually wholly consistent. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny because if you go back to the kind of very earliest days, Ripple was one of the earliest projects to actually come out. And it was one of the only ones after Bitcoin that didn't borrow almost everything from Bitcoin and basically just change, you know, the name. Like Dogecoin is an example of this, right? Um, and so Ripple really was a different set of technologies. And their vision was always really different to the point that folks who were very passionate about the hard money characteristics of Bitcoin, like myself, really didn't take them seriously for a very long time. It was like, okay, you're recreating the current financial system, which is the problem itself, using these new technologies in ways that don't solve any of the fundamental problems that I have with it. So like that was my perspective and it kind of remains my perspective, but I think that there is obviously a market for banks and central, you know, central banks and kind of larger institutions around the world who are looking for the right way to do this. And Ripple sees a market there. That seems like there's probably a market there to me too. The question is, can they compete against the homegrown solutions? Because we know that again, the people at the highest levels of finance aren't exactly known for being great at their job. So uh, what do you think, Jen? Well, I wonder if this is them kind of diversifying their business, right? They've been in this battle with the SEC for so long. The CEO has come out and said they're expected to spend, I think, $200 million in this ongoing battle. And, and so it's kind of interesting for, to me to read the story and see them in this really long drawn out fight with the government here in the US, but building this product to work with governments potentially abroad, probably outside of the US. Um, and so I'm curious how much of this is, you know, diversifying their portfolio, trying to offer maybe a little bit of a less um, risky product. But I wonder, and I don't know, Adam, if you have any thoughts here. Do you think that the privacy conversation around CBDCs is going to affect the mindset of people who operate in the XRP ecosystem right now? Uh, not particularly. Now, I'll, I'll uh, you know, fully disclaim that I have not, I do not pay very close attention to the XRP community or really to their to modern technology. It was more of a kind of back in the day type thing for me. But like I said, I think that these communities that exist out there, what they really want is they want their protocol of choice to be successful. And successful looks different in different sorts of scenarios. But what it looks like really is, hey, here's a problem that has a customer that has a use where we can really resolve that, and then that can make the the protocol more valuable, which can make the token more valuable because it's a stamp to use the protocol. That's almost the entirety of the thinking uh, when it comes to, you know, at a very high level for all of these types of projects. So again, to the extent that this takes off and they actually can get buy-in from it, and if you were to see, you know, CBDCs uh, being issued around the world uh, that were starting to utilize this, then I think that they would have a very strong argument that, first off, that that is a real use case that has a customer and has all of those things. And secondly, that that's enough maybe to drive the protocol to success for the reason that I said. So, you know, I'm I'm curious to see what the uptake is like. You know, I'm curious to see kind of how far they can get with this or if it's just, hey, here's a platform because the platform doesn't do much without customers. Zach? I'm very curious to see what's next in Ripple's bag of tricks, right? I think, you know, we are hearing much more out of them than we had in the last 18 months, say, right? And I think it's largely because signs are indicating that maybe they might be successful in this fight against the SEC. I want to go back to the Hinman speech. The Hinman speech, Hinman was a former uh, SEC commissioner who made a speech, I believe it was in 2018, indicating that Ether, the native asset of the Ethereum blockchain, would not be considered a security. And so the way Ripple has been arguing its case with the SEC is that those documents and that information would be highly relevant to their conversations around whether or not XRP could be seen as a security because that's what they got dinged for by the SEC 
some years ago now. Uh, uh, the SEC alleged that they were making uh, big, big, big sales of an unregistered security that should have, um, you know, got the stamp of approval from U.S. regulators. So the fact that the uh, judge ruled that they can't, that the government can't seal those documents, I think Ripple is starting to see that things may come uh, to a positive outcome as it relates to that case. And therefore, I think we're seeing some of these additional business activities ramp up that had sort of been frozen uh, by the uncertainty or the stasis or the limbo that they were in, specifically in the U.S. Now, that's not to say that they're not a big project in other jurisdictions. They still, I think, are a top 10, top six coin by market cap, inclusive of the stable coins out there. So certainly a big player outside of the U.S., but they have certainly been in limbo in terms of what they can do, what they can say while they're fighting this SEC case. And so now, again, with this acquisition, and I think to a lesser degree, this platform, I think they're really trying to get back out there into the world and say, hey, we're still here, we're still doing things in addition to this fight that we've mounted against U.S. regulators. It's interesting to see sort of the perception around them change uh, over these last two years while the fight has dragged on. Uh, Adam, curious for your thoughts on that part of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, a little bit off topic here, but I'm getting increasingly excited about the implications of the Coinbase uh, of the Coinbase lawsuit, and specifically some of the amicus briefs that have been put in by other parties. Um, these are sort of briefs that come from outside or entities that are asking to have a voice in this because they think that it has significance. Notably, the uh, Chamber of Commerce um, uh, put in a very, very well uh, versed letter about this, just explaining the downsides to the approach that the SEC is taking and how it might, in fact, not be lawful. Um, and so, again, like that type of thing happening is significant. And it's not just about Coinbase, that's about everything. So, that would have major implications in the Ripple case. Now, of course, if this goes to trial at all, which is not at all certain, then we don't actually know whether, you know, we don't know how long that'll take. It's very possible the Ripple resolves before that, but it's a very important case that I'm watching closely.